Hi, everyone, and welcome to GLF Live. I'm Gabrielle Lipton, editor of Landscape News for the Global Landscapes Forum, and I will be your moderator today. Two days ago, on Monday, May 2nd, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN published its 2022 State of the World's Forests Report, a sweeping document that is published only every two years and gives one of the most comprehensive overviews on forest ecosystems that we have. Today, we're going to hear from two of the experts who led this report, beginning first with a short video of the report's main findings, followed by a discussion between the speakers, and lastly, an, a live audience Q&A. So we're gonna jump right in. We're gonna start by meeting our speakers. First, we have Ewald Rametsteiner, the Deputy Director of FAO's Forestry Division. And we have Musanda Mumba, Director of the Rome Center for Sustainable Development under the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Both of them come from extensive backgrounds in forestry and forest management, forest policy. So they're really going to shed light on what this report says and give us a nice view of what's happening in forests today around the world. So we're gonna start with a excellent video that Ewald has put together. Uh, and then after that, we'll go into the Q&A. So please enjoy this video and stick around for the conversation. If we continue to destroy the planet as we currently do, and if we don't find better ways for people to buy food to get out and onwards from poverty, we will live in a very different world and it will not be a nice one. The 2022 edition of FAO's State of the World's Forests report looks into a new narrative how forests and trees can help us with solutions to get out of some of the environmental and economic crisis that we currently face. Forests and trees are vital for us on the planet. They provide air, water, food, energy and renewable materials. For us, it is really important to maintain them but de facto, they are still shrinking. The issue basically is simple. Those that are here to maintain or even grow them, they do not get enough benefits from doing so. So they continue to shrink. Now here's the thing. If we use forests and trees more wisely, we can both address environmental crisis and economic recovery needs at the same time. Forests and trees can be powerful solutions. Storing carbon and removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Here, forests and trees can provide some 14% of the additional removals of these greenhouse gases that we need to stay within 1.5 degrees by 2030. That's a major contribution. Maintaining and in some areas even increasing biodiversity by restoring forests and landscapes and using trees and forests better for renewable materials that are carbon neutral and with which we can build a more sustainable world. These are three pathways around which we have to look into the future. Protecting forests, stop deforestation, is the most important single contributions that we can make. Restoring, putting trees back into landscapes is a major way of improving our terrestrial ecosystems and productivity for our economies. And the third one is using forests and trees, using environmentally friendly renewable materials that are carbon neutral to build a better future. In any given local context, 
one or more of these can and need to be applied in a balanced way according to the situation that is needed. The three forest pathways, they connect better environment and better production. The 2022 report of FAO State of the World's Forest Report has reviewed data and evidence to find out how much do we actually know about the benefits of those pathways and the costs. How much do we know about what needs to be done to make them a reality? How much do we know about how much upscaling potential they, they have? You will not necessarily be surprised that we have found many data gaps, many areas where we think we need more discussions, more reflections, more research. But then there are also really important points that we think we have to take note. For instance, that in total, if you add up those uh, contributions of these different pathways, to climate change mitigation, we are around in the magnitude of 20%. 20% is a lot to contribute to the reduction of climate change. It is also clear that millions of jobs can be created if we restore, uh, if we restore landscapes, if we, if we put trees back into, into farms, into areas where people can make a living to improve the productivity and environmental resilience at the same time. Investment in forest pathways would have to increase by four by 2050. But this seems feasible given that the climate and the sustainability finance sectors are very dynamic nowadays. I'd like to point to two areas that I think need uh, particular attention. One is agricultural subsidies. They, they are already established mechanisms that reach farmers and the amount of funding is huge, 540 billion US dollars per year. If some of this can be reoriented from environmentally harmful to environmentally friendly productivity enhancing investments, that will give a major boost to restoration and more sustainable management of forests and agriculture, including agroforestry. This is one part. The other one is the absence of good mechanisms to reach small-scale producers. Only 1.7% of all the climate finance currently reaches small producers. We do need mechanisms to bring those billions to the small producers to change their way of how they produce today. Let me come to my last point. I have made this before because it's so important. Smallholders, local communities, indigenous peoples, they are at the center and need to be at the center of that development. Altogether, they manage around 4.3 billion hectares of land. If they can own and lead their development, and if we can support that, then we are on a winning path with forest solutions. Forests and trees can be powerful solutions for a better environment, for a better economy and for a better life for us all. All right, thank you so much for that incredible video, Ewald, and for that amazing overview of this report. And now we're gonna go into the moderated discussion uh, so I will start with you, Ewald. Uh, you covered a lot of what this report had to say in that video, uh, but what, what did this report find that surprised you? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. But let me just say how excited I am here to be here with, with you today. It's a really great venue and opportunity to discuss uh, some of the main issues that we have uh, with forests today. There were quite a few uh, surprises in there in the in the findings of that report. One is how much, <laughs> and that might be not a surprise in terms of numbers, but a surprise in terms of perspective. How how much people focus on uh, on, on problems with forests, and how much uh, solutions forests actually could bring if we shift a little bit our perspectives in terms of problems with forests to solutions with forests and trees. And that is that is a bit of a surprise because 
Yes, I mean, if you look through the media nowadays, usually you get a very negative uh, vibe after having listened to forest issues because you see the problem with forest, uh, but not the solutions with forest. That is a, that is a bit of a, of a surprise sometimes. And one of the things that I think is, is missing here is that um, there is a lot of on protection a focus on protection. Yes, we need to protect forests. No question about that whatsoever. Uh, we also need to restore forests. Uh, but what we need as a, a third leg, if you want to have a, um, a solution-oriented setup that can stand and not fall over, is that we also need to look at uh, the sustainable use and the building of green value chains with forests. They are a, a, a major source of, uh, of, of a future carbon neutral circular economy that currently that goes a little bit under the, the, the issues that we have with, with forests, which we also need to solve. So one of the a bit surprising elements, if you want, uh, in, in that context is how, how many pictures we see on forest destruction and how few pictures we see on the people that do that distraction, why they do them, and how they could do this differently. We want to have forests maintained, uh, but we are not really looking at the people who change the landscape. Almost 90% of deforestation is caused by agriculture. These are, these are not uh, un, sort of, they, they are not people that um, uh, underlying causes of deforestation. These are farmers. 90% of farms are run by family farmers. Uh, those need food income for, the, for education for the children, everything. Uh, and they need to, they make their decisions on, uh, on, on, on whether or not to, to log legally or legally, or, uh, et, et cetera. And in a way, if they don't benefit, they will possibly not change the behavior. But you, you never get this feeling if you discuss about the issues of forest that, uh, that is about people and how they make the decision and how to help them make the right decision. That's not only for deforestation. The same goes for putting trees back on their farms uh, and using them in ways and enabling them to use them in ways to be a solution for them socially and economically, but also environmentally. So that is a, that is a bit of a surprising thing with a bit of taste, because I, I think that that would be so important uh, to, uh, to, to find the right solution. But maybe if, if you allow me, I would also say a, a word about what is a bit reassuring what I, what I see from the review that we did in the context of SOFO, which essentially is a review of evidence that there is a lot that happens currently that goes in the right direction, often maybe not, not totally connected. So we have a deforestation and climate discussion about uh, at very high policy levels about how cost effective it is to use uh, or, or to stop deforestation. It's just a must. This is the single most contribution that we can make is the, in a way uh, for to hold climate change is to stop deforestation. There, there is a separate discussion on restoration, enhancing biodiversity, which often brings in livelihood elements, by the way. And, and there is a, a third discussion that is also in a different environment uh, around the sustainable use of wood, of climate neutral materials, of, uh, of um, uh, circular economies. These three are in three different arenas. They, they not necessarily look, look over to the others and combine this. This is a bit what uh, Sofo wanted to do. So maybe I give back the floor to you um, on, on that answer. Uh, thank you, Yuval. That was... Such good, uh, I feel like you just put us in the center of some of the discussions that are happening uh, at the moment around force. And I think it's really, uh, it's really good to hear from my perspective that there is more optimism coming into play and looking at forests through this lens of how can we use them as solutions, not just all of these uh, bad news headlines that we're seeing often portrayed. Uh, so that's really nice to hear. And to your point about deforestation, I'd like to go to Musanda with a question about that. Um, and I'll begin this question also 
uh, by saying that Musanda recently moved from the Rome Center for Sustainable Development uh, to actually become a senior advisor for the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Uh, I apologize for the mix up at the beginning when I made that introduction, but she's now focusing all of her efforts on restoration, not only of forests, but also other ecosystems. So we couldn't ask for anything more. Thank you, Musanda. Um, but going back to what Ewald was saying about deforestation, among the many staggering figures in this report, halting deforestation and maintaining forests was found to offer 14% of the emissions reductions needed to keep global warming at that 1.5 degree threshold. Uh, at COP26 last year, there was a major pledge from global leaders to end forest loss. There are also many other efforts happening around the world to uh, put some kind of end to the rates of deforestation we've been seeing. So Musanda, I would like to hear from your perspective if these efforts, if these pledges are being actually backed up with the action that's needed to bring them to life. No, thank you so very much for that question. And I just want to say to Evald and the, uh, the FAO, our crew and many others behind the scenes who made this report such a success and just really a lot of great work and incredible work that was taking place a lot last year in when I was in my previous role as the, the director of the Rome Center. I just want to set the scene, Gabriel, a little bit to say that last year was a very interesting year and it set the scene for a lot of multilateral uh, you know, processes. The G7, the UK was the G7 presidency. Um, and also Italy was the G20 president. And we saw that in their communiques, both these processes at this sort of government and global leadership level of you know, countries from the G20 and G7 countries, there was a lot of talk about nature. Why did nature matter in the work that was happening? But also we saw you know, bringing forests front and center. And remember, it was also a very interesting year because both Italy and the UK that were, you know, G20 and G7 presidencies respectively, were also the presidents for COP26 and COP, you know, COP26 COP presidency with Italy as well. And so by the time the world came to COP26 in Glasgow, I think there was, you know, a culmination and energy and a conversation to say, we need to do something about this. And remember, we were also just really getting into the end or not so quite the end of this pandemic, but a realization that our actions, especially around deforestation has also increased the levels of zoonosis. So when that Glasgow you know, fact was actually shared, I also want to say what was also very different about it was that there was a lot of private sector engagement which was absolutely brilliant. So we see private sector engaging on deforestation-free commodities, for example, talking about you know, green value chains, much better streamlined and healthier value chains. And Evald actually um, alluded to that. So for me, what's important, and I think what's critical is, you know, we're having several processes happening. We've just had UNEA, um, UNEP at 50 here in Nairobi. We're going uh, in a few days to the UN, you know, UNCCD uh, land desertification COP in Abidjan, where there's a lot of conversation around land, and then Stockholm at 50. And right now, as Ivald and I are talking, we have the Forest Congress happening in South Korea. So already, the, the pressure on governments to move from pledges to action is much more happening now than ever. But also bringing on board, you know, private sector entities, what are they doing? And I think we're beginning to see where the transparency is coming from in terms of you know, different private sector entities saying, look, these are deforestation free value chains and the transparency about that in their processes. And so it's really good to see that this is coming, but we'll, you know, I'm waiting to see at COP27 with some report back to say you know, how many countries actually did a commitment and perhaps you know, Eva, we're waiting also to see at the Forest Congress, you know, some outcome just from that pledging that happened in Glasgow. So let's see. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Musanda. I also will be interested to see what happens at this year's COP. I think some of those pledges will be held up to a magnifying glass and we'll see what has happened and what hasn't. But your point about private sector engagement, which is so crucial for uh, just accelerating some of these processes, we need their help. Uh, Evald, I would like to give the question back to you. We are in the midst of an economic crisis globally and it might not slow anytime soon. How can forests help mitigate this? 
Yes, that's a, that's a that's a good and not so easy question to answer, I guess. Um, while we have the private sector, let's not forget that private sector in our minds and the people that are in Glasgow, are these are the big private sector players. But a lot of what uh, what we actually need is the small producers uh, that will not uh, uh, get on a plane and, and and go to one of these big pledges. So we need these both these connection uh, from uh, from the big players to the small players and this is where a global economic crisis comes in because a lot of the a lot a lot of the hits that have been taken or are taken in in times of crisis are 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 those that were in vulnerable conditions already we have a we have a, a global figure of an impact of 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 the economic crisis i think of covid and counting around 3 trillion us dollars but this is a big amount but the, the ones that are hit most are the ones that are pushed back into extreme poverty. And this is this is around 10% uh, or a little less than 10%, let's say 125 million people that are now back in extreme poverty. And these are all often those that are working in agriculture and that are working in rural areas. These are private sector people too. And the recent conflict that we see uh, not being uh, able to be stopped now is is pushing food and, and and fuel prices further up as well. None of this is helping, and what it means for forests usually is that uh, what it means for people first of all, especially those in extreme poverty, they need to prioritize short short term necessities over a longer or medium term uh, goals that will drive us towards more sustainability. As we know. Um, Forests have, in these cases, often played and do play a role of a safety net. We have billions of people, 3.5 billion, we estimate, and so forth, that use non-wood forest products, and a similar amount of people, a little less, uh, that uh, use wood for cooking food. People in, in Nairobi, I guess, uh, Musonda, they will shift back to charcoal from uh, from LT LPG because they can't afford as the prices for fuel go up. So they will eat into uh, a future resource in by ne necessity. So if we if we continue this economic crisis, if we continue to seeing this, we are we are not on the right path. Uh, and being a safety net for forests is not enough to really help in a, a global economic crisis. So if we want a forest to make a stronger contribution to economic recovery, uh, we can look at forests as a resource. But what is really important, and I hope, uh, Musonda, you agree, is to, to add trees to the equation. If you, if you add trees to, it, to the equation, you get that much more powerful leverage. A lot of the people that are in the extreme poor, they need income from agriculture. Around a quarter of people on the planet is employed in agriculture. So as long as you work with farmers, and as long as you work with, um, with agriculture uh, and you help them adding trees on farms through restoration, uh, through ways of using uh, and adding income opportunities, diversifying income opportunities in an economic crisis. And, even only for subsistence of fuel wood, then you are making a difference for economic uh, recovery. The same goes if you go to, to villages in, in rural areas, local communities, and if you are able to use some of the, of the recovery funding to help them mobilize to restore their own backyard, if you want, that is degraded and unproductive lands by planting trees and building a future, then uh, then I think you're also helping uh, a global economic crisis because they get hopefully more, a bit more self-sufficient and a bit more owning their own development. Some countries have done this uh, very fast when they when the COVID hit uh, job markets such as Pakistan, but also others. The uh, the only thing that you need to make sure in this in this case is, is that you don't uh, pay for, for for planting and then you walk away. You have to ensure that people in these localities care about these trees. And that is only possible if you really add an, um, an economic uh, component to it. And a lot of the restoration efforts, uh, such as the Great Green Wall or others, they are looking at the environmental and the economic aspects. But then we, I don't think, have enough focus on enabling the local populations to invest more into more modern and higher value added production from forests and trees to benefit from them. Some, some of the countries that have had uh, restoration in the past at, 
large scale, just as Korea, the host of the World Forestry Congress, just now ongoing, or China, but also others such as Norway, for instance. Uh, they have invested in getting green back into their landscapes, restoring their lands, and now they have resources that they can make better use of in, 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 in a situation. And that is, in a way, what we need. We need solutions that can be applied at scale in rural areas that are quite cost effective compared to others and that are equitable so that they bring in those people that are pushed into extreme poverty. And that can be implemented fairly rapidly. And I would say uh, forests and trees in many ways uh, are these types of solutions. So in SOFO 2022, uh, we argue that we need to find solutions that work locally with the people to conserve the right forests, enrich others, landscapes, and use them more wisely, wisely and empower people to use them. Because that can often not be done from far away or from by a big business. It needs the, the local capacity to do so. Back to you, Gabriel. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, I'm really liking this narrative that's coming out here about how we have to change some of our lenses and change some of our vocabulary. Like we started with thinking about forests as solutions rather than just challenges. And now you're saying we need to expand our concept of the private sector to go all the way down to the local people who depend on not just forests, but also trees. And I really hope some of these messages from the report um, come across and get spread widely because they're so important. Um, it, to all of our listeners, this is, as you can tell, a very quick moving conversation. There's so much this, that this report covers. So if you have any questions at any time, please drop them in the chats of the platform on which you're listening, because we'll keep some time at the end for audience questions. So if anything is just whizzing by a bit too quickly, just ask it and we can address it at the end. Um, Musanda, another question for you uh, that again gets back to what you all was saying about the people on the ground, the local people. The latest IPCC report found that almost half of humanity lives in areas that are set to be massively disrupted by climate change, perhaps to the point of being unlivable. That's the word that the report used. So what role can forests play in the action needed to adapt to these changes? Thank you so much for that question. And I want to build up a little bit on what Eval said, but I just want to just, you know, conjure this. It's not a vision, but a reality into the to the minds of people watching. If you're not on the Indian continental land, you know, subcontinental landmass, you, you probably don't know that three days ago, parts of India and mainly in some really populous cities, it was 62 degrees centigrade. And I repeat, 62 degrees centigrade. And if you've lived in a city that's hit 40, it becomes incredibly unbearable and worse when it's humid. So um, I was chatting with a friend of mine yesterday who actually lives in Delhi and she sent me a picture. And the only place where it was cooler was in the highland, higher up in, 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 in Delhi, in the forests. So that in itself is very telling that you know, forests are very much needed in our suburban, in our urban spaces. And we've seen this more and more, and FO has been working a lot on cities and forests. And this has been very clearly evident that with climate change, we're going to see a lot more localized heating and, and, and having a forest, even a more biodiverse city, you know, forest within a city actually helps with the cooling effect of a city. I live here in Nairobi, and fortunately, we're very lucky to to have the Karura Forest, which is smack in the middle of Nairobi with over a thousand acres of trees and just really beautiful. And you can go walking in there and it was a space of refuge for many people during COVID, but also when the, some of the impacts of climate change hit. So for people to be able to adapt, we'll need more green spaces. And I also just wanna add that, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, we are in the UN decade of family farming as well. And so a lot of family farms, we need to encourage a lot of, you know, communities to have, you know, agro what C4 does, what ECROF does, what, you know, FAO has been doing on the ground, encouraging agroforestry, but also biodiverse agroforestry. And, and in reference to the three elements of the SDGs, the social, the economic, and the environmental, all of these three factors require resilience. We need resilience on the ground to be able to adapt appropriately. If we're not resilient enough, we're going to have these shocks that keep coming at us. You know, the world was in a space of shock, you know, shock from the pandemic, 
shock from the financial crisis right now, inflation, et cetera, rise in fuels, um, you know, food crisis. And we, we are in a state of shock and flat. And so how do we you know, manage all of that? So this will really be something that will be very difficult, particularly for the most poor in the world. And so back to your point, we are seeing this today, today, you know, in India where it's unbearably hot, you know, these heat waves will continue, not just in India, we're gonna see it in parts of tropical um, Africa, Latin America and different places. And even Europe, we've seen in the Med, in the Mediterranean region, how these shifts of the fires that were happening just last year. So these shifts are going to be happening. So how do we make sure that we, in, you know, we keep including and, and reducing the degradation where it's happened and where possible restoring these spaces? And if it's not been degraded, maintaining those spaces, because we will need them for sure. Over to you. Thanks, Musanda. I think what you're saying pivots perfectly off of a report that also just came out um, from the UNCCD about land degradation, and it found that 40% of, up to 40% of the world's lands are degraded, uh, which is a staggering amount. Meanwhile, the um, the State of the World's Forest report found that 2.2 uh, that 68 percent of this amount can be best restored through agroforestry and incorporating trees with alcohol with agriculture. Would you like to speak to this point a bit as well? I can give that to you, y'all. <laughs> oh, yes. So I I didn't get that. Uh, so that was on, on agroforestry with uh, with uh, restoration through agroforestry. Well, the the issue with uh, with degradation is that uh, we have a lot of focus on it now with the with the decade. the The first investment that is often there is to find ways to plant trees and then to to walk away because nobody is really taking care of them, and the uh, mosaic. Uh, Mosaic uh, restoration in uh, in many ways would be the right thing to do in landscape where it fits, and putting trees back uh, in farming landscapes is a really important area. I thought Musonda, maybe you should say a bit more on this uh, than I do because you are focusing on on ecosystem restoration nowadays. But agroforestry is a is a very important system that hasn't really picked up by farmers that much because they see it as uh, as too risky. Uh, too risky to invest, too, too unproductive, too long time uh, between the, the seeding of, of a produce, harvesting and getting the money back. So they, they often stay in, uh, in their own systems because nobody is taking the risk away from them and nobody is, is actually helping them come up with the upfront investment that is needed. It takes a little longer to build resilient uh, ecosystems and resilient incomes from different sources if you move away from what you what you're used to do let's not forget that most of the farmers say 80 percent of the farmers are are really rather small scale farmers so they don't have a, a, a lot of margin of risk to take uh, before they risk their families asking them to do things that they are not comfortable uh, with the risk to take is uh, is a major issue and that's one of the issues with uh, with agroforestry it would need um, it would need up up front support for people to do that but once you do that and once you find ways of uh, of dealing with the different value streams that come from agroforestry then you have a much more resilient system as musonda said both environmentally and economically and this is where we need to go and also from a simple uh, climate change point of view agroforestry is a very cost effective way of uh, fixing more carbon in uh, in soils and adding biodiversity so there is a lot that speaks for it at the at the conceptual level and at the scientific levels uh, also at the macroeconomic levels but what we need to do is to find ways for people who need to do that change to, to do that change and here we have the issue of uh, of, of costs and risks of the individual uh, uh, sort of risk takers which are uh, too often 
small. So I think addressing this a bit more, what is the cost and benefits of agroforestry is a major question of the day uh, because we do know a lot more about the overall benefits and we do know a lot more about the techniques, the, the, the simple biophysical and the, and the managerial aspects of agroforestry than we, than we necessarily do about how to make people use that. Uh, and that is one of the future uh, sort of pushes that so far also argues that need to be done if we want to really um, push agroforestry forward, which is a very productive and resilient system as compared to many of the agricultural systems that we currently have. Thank you, Yuan. Thank you for stressing the resiliency that we need and that is involved through some of these restoration methods. Musanda, would you like to comment on this as well and perhaps also give us a glimpse into perhaps how it feeds into the negotiations that are set to start in Abidjan next week? Sure. No, absolutely. Um, I think it's really exciting that the the COP is finally happening, um, the land desertification COP in Abidjan, because obviously it was canceled a year ago due to COVID, as we very well know. But I also want to build up a little bit on what Ewald has said. I mean, some of the complexities, and I must say, of all the three rear conventions, the UNCCD is the only convention where member states have actually negotiated and discussed the importance of land tenure. Because we cannot walk into this place and talk about, you know, reforestation or agroforestry or let alone restoration agenda without talking about the elephant in the room, land tenure, which is complex in many places in the world and let alone on this continent where I'm from in Africa. So this is a very critical, you know, conversation that will be happening in, in Abidjan. And I must say that with the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, all of the three RIA conventions, including UNCCD, pushed really for this decade to come alive, which is the decade that FAO and UNEP are, are leading, and we as UNDP are a strategic partner on that. Now, coming to the agroforestry element and conversation, we must I must also add that, you know, I think one of the most important um, discussions right now, particularly from ACRAF and C4, is the importance and power of research. We know that, you know, specific trees and plants will may, may or may not grow in a 1.5 degree plus. You know, so how do we also help you know, farmers prepare and be ready for this shift and change. And yes, at the localized level, I've seen examples in one of the landscape initiative, the landscape um, restoration initiative in Eastern Zambia, where farmers have been doing farmer to farmer peer learning. That is so important because at the community level is, look at what I've done, look at how um, I've done this and why it matters. And really for a lot of peoples, and we can talk about this, particularly indigenous peoples, a lot of these spaces, you know, we don't just look at forests as just standing trees that are just standing there and looking green and nice at us. You know, these forests are so intimate to their lives, they're intimate to their culture, their food systems, it's intimate to their, you know, to their rituals even, to, to um, you know, drums, djembe and others that are actually carved from specific trees that are so special. People, so it's a very holistic and regenerative space, and the more needed to really empower communities and make sure that we're also listening to what's needed within this framing of a changing world. You know, what can they grow? There, you know, there's a lot of research that ECRAF has done, for instance, on you know grafting and replanting some tree species, and what combination should they have on their farms? You know, some native, some indigenous, because that combination is critical for agrobiodiversity, work that FAO has been advocating for years. And now we're talking about you know, agrobiodiversity, we're talking about agroecology. Um, and this is so, so pertinent now more than ever because more resilient systems are those systems that are biodiverse. And, and Ewald alluded to that as well. The kind of tree, is it the right tree? Is it the wrong tree? But also it's not just the planting, it's the growing. <laughs> has it survived? And I think there was a report in the BBC yesterday about the elements of greenwashing around restoration. You know, in these days with earth observation and satellite, we can look down and say, well, nothing has grown. You, you, you committed 50 million trees over there. Nothing is there. Um, and you can prove it. Um, and so, you know, how can we be honest and transparent about action that really needs to be meaningful on the ground? And this is what's also very, very important for communities as well. Thank you, Musanda. Um, so many incredible points are being made in these answers and the extent of how we need to change our forest use is so far reaching. Uh, we're already getting um, 
uh, quite a few audience questions and I wanna make sure that we have time for them. Um, so I'm gonna give one more question to Ewald and then um, we'll pivot into some final messages and then go into those audience questions so we can make sure that they're given the, the attention that they need. Um, but Ewald, uh, when you were talking about forests as solutions, one thing that's really come to our attention and we just can't escape it these days is that we are a world that depends on fuel. And as a solution, how can forests sustainably play a role in the energy sector? Uh, yes, a very pertinent question. Another very pertinent question on forests and trees and, and, and their role. Uh, we know very well that uh, wood plays a huge role as energy source. Some 2.6 billion people rely on wood to cook their food. That's a figure that is out there for quite some time. And it will stay fairly high until uh, 2030. Still, we think it will be around 2 billion. And most of this is traditional uh, energy, uh, sort of a fairly polluting environmentally uh, questionable source source of energy but overall in the in the in the bigger picture um, wood is the largest uh, source of renewable energy nowadays I mean we we run on 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 fossil energy to uh, say 86 percent or, or so but so you have we have a fairly small share of renewable energy resources and the by far largest share of renewable energy resources is woody biomass. So if it comes to renewable energy, uh, we are looking at wood basically, not much else. It's a little bit of agriculture, but that's it. And if you if you look at uh, the energy discussions that you have, especially in the in in the, in the West, it's mostly about solar, wind, uh, and, and and others. Um, but there is very little on wood, which is actually the largest share of renewable energy sources. The issue is that a lot of this is not where it should be. And we have a, a couple of, of, of things to uh, really look at hard here, uh, because if we want to go to a net zero emissions world by 2050, the International Energy Agency has just presented a roadmap on it. And they say we need around 60% more uh, of modern bioenergy, which is largely in some ways will affect uh, forests because it would have to come for in realistic terms to quite a bit from, uh, from areas that are possibly not yet reforested or that are currently forested. So if we want to have a net zero emissions world, we need to look at woody biomass for energy uh, if, if, if we want to be realistic. But this has a couple of issues. Uh, where should that come from? Uh, how do we not want to degrade more land? How do we not want to, to become an industrial provider of primary material that goes from, from landscapes into the incinerator? How, how not to, uh, to get into this world? But nonetheless, how not to throw out uh, the, the necessities and the opportunities that we need uh, and that we have with degraded land and productive land to use for local uh, energy supply. The, the term of resilience was big in the last question. Yes, how how can we use, and how can we, how can not we, how can local communities see whether some degraded land can be used for 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 their resilient energy supply? That's one. That's one area that I think needs a hard look. Uh, with all the consequences that they could, this could have in terms of balancing environmental environmental benefits uh, through reducing fossil fuel emissions from environmental costs from uh, from uh, eating into our biodiversity in the worst of cases. And the other thing is uh, this, this need to transition from uh, inefficient uh, traditional energy sources to modern bioenergy systems. There is a lot that, uh, that happens today a lot of modern systems run on wood pellets, for example, uh, that, that is much more energy efficient, efficient than, than a lot of the traditional energy use that we have. So I think we need here to, again, maybe I'm repeating myself, but we need to find, we, we find the realistic spaces within the, the local uh, economies to see 
what is right in those contexts and what are their conditions in terms of resources, what are their conditions in terms of energy needs, what are their uh, opportunities to replace a non-renewable resource like fossil fuels, fuels with, a re with renewable resources. And yes, we have to be very careful with, uh, with biodiversity issues, but yes, we also have to be very uh, fast in terms of reducing climate change impacts as we blow out fossil fuels also for energy. The, the answer in many ways conceptually is easy. In practice, it's a bit more difficult. I mean, what we have to move towards is to move away from as far as this is feasible and possible um, in, 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 the, in the localities, to move away from uh, burning a, a valuable renewable resource at the start, not using primary uh, sources of material, uh, but moving towards the use of wood residues, the end of pipe, where we, ha we don't have another high value added use for it. Uh, and then we have to invest much more in, in, in energy efficiency. We, wait, we waste much too much energy now that we wouldn't need necessarily to waste if we would be a bit more careful with the material and the way we, we consume. Thanks for that really incredible overview, Ewald. And I liked your point about, again, looking at this in the localized context, and that's what Musanda was saying as well about agroforestry. It's just that everything needs to be taken down to the ground and looked at with science about what works where. So thank you for raising that point again. Uh, so we'll move into audience questions now. And again, to any of our listeners, if you have anything you'd like to ask our speakers, please drop them in the chats. And then I'll save a few minutes for some final messages at the very end before we close. But Musanda, someone from Facebook is asking a question that I think is pertinent to you and your work, which is, what is the impact of this report on national policies for restoration? Well, the impact of this report um, on national policies is that now, you know, countries, particularly now, and I'll give an example of Africa, which has um, under the African Union, what's called the, the FR100, the afforestation, where governments have made commitments and pledges of the extent of land uh, they're going to restore. For example, Kenya made a, a commitment of, uh, you know, 50 million, um, if not billion trees, um, you know, planted, etc., and all of that. But what does that mean in reality? So there was a need for a mapping exercise to really say this is how the phased approach is going to be done, because we know even from the, um, uh, the, the Desertification Convention, UNCCD, countries are committed to what are called land degradation neutrality targets. They commit to say, we want so much land restored, but in reality, they have just remained that, pledges. So what this report, what the SOFO does is to really now, you know, explicitly show where the science and the policy come together, but also begin to say, well, we need to do something now and it's rather urgent. And the reason it's urgent is for the reasons of energy, it's for the reasons of livelihoods, it's even for the reasons of economies. Um, Eval did mention um, earlier about just the crisis that we're seeing that's emerged between you know, Ukraine and Russia. The cost of energy just in the East Africa community has quadrupled. That means the average person is back to firewood. So the rates of deforestation, which we were seeing slightly taper are now up again because there is no other option. And so what does that actually mean in terms of a commitment? What are the options? But what we're also beginning to see is, a, is an expedition, I think, from governments and, and putting in place policies around renewables. You know, What other renewable options do we have other than what we have where there's unsustainable destruction of firewood and, 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 and also charcoal, um, as it were? So this report is a really, really pivotal and important in just pivoting and making sure because we, we, we're actually hitting several nails just with one hammer. You know, we look at, you know, biodiversity, we look at climate change, we look at land degradation, we look at, you know, livelihoods, economies, all of this is interconnected. So we need to think about the system as a system. And so now one of the conversations that will be happening in Abidjan will be very much an element of accountability. Okay, so how are governments now moving to action? How much investment does the actual national budget commit to that investment on restoration. And where is the restoration happening? Is it the coastal mangroves? Is it the for, you know, you know, forestry, um, for instance, here in Kenya, they're doing a lot of um, uh, reforestation in the Mao catchment area, et cetera. Well, we see also a lot of tea growing, which is an export 
you know, uh, commodity. So how do we make sure that there's a balance? There's a balance. And so these are very critical conversations that are happening. Thanks, Musanda. Um, and thanks again for linking this to what's going to happen next week in Abidjan. I think that just has potential to be such an important two weeks of conversations, and hopefully it will address some of these issues and hold governments more, more accountable. Uh, there's a question coming in again from Facebook. According to the report, and this touches on something you just said, 75% of our materials are non-renewable. And in order to halt deforestation and enhance our um, use of wood products, how can we do this at the same time? And I know this was touched upon in our conversation, but I think this listener maybe wants a bit more information on the balance of ending deforestation, but also switching to wood products um, and something more renewable. So Ewald, perhaps you would like to take this one. Yes, thank you, Gabriela, and thank you for the question. That's a, that's a really hard nut to crack. Uh, because it, uh, as, as many of those things, it is smack in the middle of how do we balance the protection uh, with, with the use. We have an increasing number of people uh, with increasing affluence or in terms of crisis uh, that need material. And I think this is one of the issues that we can't get away from uh, with all the wishes that we have to protect the environment. It is also a question of, is it, is it the right thing to do uh, to focus on protection when there are other needs at the same time. And then uh, some people may take this decision or another decision, but what is what will what will not change is that in the aggregate, there is a huge hunger uh, with a growing population for renewable um, materials and resources. So what we can do now in a way is just to to look at this with an open eye and say, protection alone is not enough because it will not help. Uh, when I was young, the, the, the big issue that brought me to, to forestry and work where I'm now, it was uh, tropical deforestation. That's, that's, that's more than 30 years ago, close to 40. Uh, we still are on this question because there is a hunger for, for, for material. So if we only focus on the protection, I don't think we will make it. And hence this uh, plea to look at uh, not only at the protection, but also at the restoration and the need of people to live from materials and live from them in a way that are more renewable. And that needs a, that needs a mentality change that doesn't exclude the use of renewable materials because we will need that. But it also needs a mentality change and that is for the environmental uh, inclined uh, uh, communities. But it needs also this, this, this change for the economic inclined uh, communities that we can't go on destroying uh, our resources. If we do that, we will suffer more later on. And this is exactly where we are in terms of this is the solution space that we have. What can we do in concrete localities in terms of protecting and uh, providing people with more renewable materials by looking more at productivity, by looking more at the costs and the benefits of not doing so. And this is a plea that so far in some ways puts forward for discussions for governments also to say, okay, don't we need to recalibrate what, what we have to do uh, adjusted to the realities on the specific location? So I can't really given a, a blanket answer on, on saying how do we reduce the non-renewables and increase the renewables by protecting all the forest. It will not be possible. But what we know is that the demand for materials will continue heating up with the increasing population. Not only for materials, also for, uh, for, for energy, of course. But at the same time, we all depend on a healthy planet. And that's the, that's the bottom line of it that everybody needs to understand. There is no healthy economy on an unhealthy or broken planet. And that is not always uh, fully understood in the economic decision-making space. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. Um, again, once again, stressing the point about what works where and the localities of it all as we navigate this tough, tough path forward. Uh, we have time for one more question, which I will rephrase it a bit to ask what I think the listener is trying to ask. Uh, it comes from Christelle, also on Facebook. And Musanda, I'll give it to you. And she's asking about 
any messages that you have for countries where deforestation is still an issue and how those messages can be used to link civil society, big organizations, big companies, and government. So how can we kind of, I guess what she's asking is how do we start a conversation through start strong messaging between these different sectors in countries where deforestation is really pressing? Well, no, thank you, Christelle, for that question. I want to say that we live in a very interconnected world. And I think Ivald has alluded to that. And that interconnectivity is very much con you know, connected to what we, we use in our everyday life. And I'll give a very classic example of some of the work that we're doing within UNDP. We saw that there was quite some high and alarming rates of deforestation in Ecuador, for example. And so um, we were working and we are now working very closely with a company in Italy called La Vaza, which is a coffee producing company to make sure that they're sourcing their coffee in deforestation free landscapes. So we have to remember that sometimes it takes something that, you know, we, we take for granted, we're having coffee every day, but do we know where it's coming from? So in this connected world, we also have to remember that some of the accountability conversation is coming from civil society, for example, shareholders, um, in companies, uh, various companies, to be able to hold these companies to account and say, look, we noticed that this particular product is coming from this region and from this locale, and it's putting pressure on the forest, and this is what we've seen. And similarly, on the ground, to have you know, robust policies, the issue on policies, and this we've seen in mainly the really, you know, sort of poor tropical countries, Colombia, Peru, Brazil, Congo DRC, Indonesia, we've seen with the palm oil, conversation, I was actually quite surprised, you know, when there was a ban last week, it was more of an economic conversation than there was even a deforestation conversation. And yet for the longest, there's been a whole conversation around, you know, having sustainable production of palm oil, et cetera, and really companies taking into account the necessity to have robust rules, issues of traceability, you know, tracing the source of, you know, specific wood, and more recently, the European Union, has also put in place specific directives to make sure that there isn't a leakage because Europe was also a region that was uh, bringing in about 50% of actually illegal timber. So where is this timber coming? You know, so this issue of traceability is also very, very critical. So we are in a very interconnected world that everybody at that table has to have a conversation. How do we stop this problem? Because we are sharing this planet. As Ivald clearly said, you know, we cannot live on an unhealthy planet and assume that our economies will be thriving. They will never, because everything is interconnected. And so an individual um, receiving a commodity in Rome has implications on a landscape in Ecuador, perhaps in Peru, even in Congo, or let alone here in Kenya. So this interconnectivity is where the policy shift needs to happen. And that's why these intergovernmental processes also matter. This is why when the COP is happening next week, heads of state are coming together to really say, this is what we're doing on the ground, working together either as a bloc, the African Union, together with the AU, similarly Asia and Latin America, how do we come together as a collective to resolve this very complex issue and yet resolvable issue? Thanks, and thanks for taking us all the way from knowing where your coffee comes from to these intergovernmental dialogues that happen uh, at the policy level. I think there are similarities all the way through. Uh, so we're coming up on time here. So I'll end with one last question that I'll put to both of you. And if you can just keep it short and sweet, which I think fits the question anyway, which is what is a finding from this report that you want listeners to remember most, a finding that you think has impacts to change the world? Uh, Ewald, we'll start with you. Well, uh, I, I believe I want to get across two things. One is that forests and trees are so hugely important assets for us on the planet and as, as people that we have to protect them, but we also have to build them up and to use them better because they are a way, as Musonda said so nicely, uh, to, to, that to hit several nails with one hammer on the environmental and the economic side, if we want to build a more sustainable and circular economy, yes, you have a solution just in front of you. That's the, that's the first thing. The, the other one is that, no, it will not work in the abstract or at global scale with one solution. We need the local people. It needs to be with the local people. They need to lead and own their development with the proper guidance and incentives. There is a lot of work to do. 
and I believe for for us as as, as listeners or as as talkers here, uh, I think we all are producers in some ways. Uh, of knowledge, of communication, of, of reports, of whatever you do in uh, as a listener. There is a lot that you can bring this forward in, in terms of a solution uh, to, to work for, for, for people. And then we can also do this as consumers. We all consume. We had this example just now of, of, of coffee. We all make decisions on what we do from uh, taking a plane or, uh, or going with a bus uh, or taking a bicycle. These are things that do have an impact. They are not enough, even in the aggregate, without proper policy framing, but they do have an impact. So making, making conscious choices of what we do ourselves as producers and consumers, I think is a key element to a solution. Yes, we all have a role to play for sure. Thank you, Ewald. Rusanda, over to you. No, thank you so very much to you, Gabrielle, and also to the GLF. I mean, what I want to say is just the importance of indigenous people and traditional peoples who have, as we know from many reports, particularly the IPES report that really clearly said 20% of the populations that they make up of and they protect 80% of our biodiversity, of which most of it are forests. And I think we need to recognize them and really respect and see where the convergence comes in from the traditional knowledge systems and indigenous knowledge systems and why they matter for the conventional science and why the solution has to be paired with that going forward in terms of how we resolve some of these complex issues. And lastly, I want to say that, you know, um, we know that COVID is obviously an outcome of zoonosis and very much connected to the degradation of land and particularly forest ecosystems. We cannot afford another pandemic. We saw how disruptive that was and how it, it, it killed people we loved, people we knew in everyday life. We cannot just afford that. We need to do something different and live differently. And I think this was what was also very highlighted from this report, that we need to make sure that, you know, we are managing these ecosystems sustainably, beautifully, because they matter for us, for our health and for our very existence on this planet. Thank you. Thank you, Musanda, and thank you both so much, not only for joining this conversation, but also for giving us this report and all of the work and effort that went into it over two years, because it just lays out so many pathways that we need to take into account as we plan our future. So thank you so much for your efforts on this publication. Uh, Ewald, Risanda, it's been such a pleasure to everyone who joined us. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day, and we'll see you next time on GLF Live. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Eva. Bye, Gabrielle. Thank you. And thank you bye to bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.